this year. Um, we are recording these presentations so that we can share them with others. I'm sorry, I didn't check with all the presenters. So if there is a problem with recording, with the recording, I'll, I'll circle back with you before we post this anywhere. Um, so the, there are five um, categories for these awards. The technical engineering, transportation and development, water resources, structures, ports and waterways and small projects and construction studies that are less than a million and a half dollars. And so each of these categories can receive an outstanding award and two honor awards. And the evaluation criteria are these, innovative features, excellence in design, contribution to public welfare and safety, compatibility with environment and sustainability, cost effectiveness, aesthetics, and effective use of materials. And, and I want to thank the judges um, this year, Trevor Lighty, Perry Cole, Dimitrios, uh, and I, I can say his last name, Ron Lemkuller, Bob Swarner, and, and myself. Um, thank you very much, judges, for reviewing these projects. And, uh, and with that, we, this is the order that we will follow of the presentations. We'll start with the small projects, the water resource, and that's the camera house, then the water resources category, and that's the Ebright Creek Fish Passage, then the geotechnical category, and that's the reverse edge levy setback, then structures, and that's the climate pledge arena. Then for transportation and development, we have the airfield payment replacement and infrastructure upgrade project, then the Seattle Tacoma International Airport. North Satellite Modernization, and last one will be the North Gate Link Extension. And the format is going to be of about 10 minutes for each of them, seven minutes of presentation, and then three minutes of questions and answers. And with that, I give it to, to Nina. I'll stop Thank sharing so that, so that you can start sharing. Sounds good. All right. Okay, to start off, uh, my name is Janina Kavachi with Osborne Consulting, and today I'll be presenting the Kenmore Boathouse project, and this finished construction last year in the spring. Um, Osborne managed the project as a continuation of the Rhododendron Park Pathwork, and that was part of the City of Kenmore's Connecting to Waterways initiative. To start off, I'd like to introduce Rob Sarah McCord, the City of Kenmore Parks Project Manager for the Boathouse project, who will say, begin by saying a few words before I cover design and construction elements. Thanks, Nina. Hello, everyone. Uh, the Kenmore Public Boathouse is a versatile 40 foot by 70 foot rowing and recreation facility located in the park in the city of Kenmore. The boathouse sits on the southern bank of the Sammamish River, less than half a mile from where it feeds into northern Lake Washington. And the boathouse is the only public access boathouse of its kind in the North Lake Washington region. The ground floor of the facility contains storage space for rowing shells and equipment, as well as areas for boat repair work. And the upper mezzanine level provides office space and a multi-purpose coaching slash training slash event space with a balcony that overlooks the river. This space was specifically engineered to be modular and multifunctional to accommodate different programmatic needs at different times. And the Kenmore Public Boathouse Project arose out of the apparent and expressed need from our local rowing community. All of the North Shore School District High School teams now call the Boathouse home and it houses the Kenmore Rowing Club as well as other local rowers. There are a variety of programs offered at the Boathouse from adult practices and learn to row courses to youth summer and after school camps with scholarships available to ensure cost is never a barrier to participation. Since it opened this past summer, more than 400 individual rowers have taken part in Kenmore Public Boathouse programs. And we do wanna thank uh, all the financial contributors from the state of Washington to King County and the city of Kenmore, as well as the North Shore, North Shore School District. Um, and of course, our wonderful design and engineering team. So to talk a little bit more about that, someone who is far more qualified than, than me, Nina. Thanks, Rob. Um, let's move to the next slide. So. 
One of the most valuable parts of the design process for me was really collaborating with an advisory committee made up of members from the George Pocock Rowing Foundation, the North Shore School District, Kenmore Rowing Club, and local rowing community members. They provided valuable feedback to our design team regarding elements that worked well in other boathouses, common issues, and program and training needs. And throughout this process, we understood that the boathouse is more than just a storage space for boats, but it needed to have other programmatic elements, such as a covered training space, coach's office, and room for repairing boats as well. The rendering to the right by J3 Architects shows one of the figures produced from an options analysis process to determine the best orientation of the boathouse given the fixed 40 by 70 foot footprint. The rowing shells are stored in the lower two bays of the boathouse with the training space above and there are restrooms and an office space on the north end of the building as well. The advisory committee provided valuable feedback to our design team. One comment in particular was that some boathouses could be dark and damp in the storage bays, and so translucent panels were, and windows were added to harness more natural lighting for the interior bays, as shown in the figure to the right. Another design element was the prefabricated nature of the metal building and integration uh, of a balcony area facing the river for public viewing access. The boathouse was sited to integrate with an ADA accessible existing pathway on the exterior uh, in gray, shown in gray, and maintain interior ADA accessibility through the addition of a wheelchair lift to the mezzanine area. In the photo to the right, you can see the ADA pathway with the railing leading up to the boathouse and restroom facility entrances on the north end. And um, these facilities um, also were oriented in such a way to allow for a space for queuing and um, also cleaning of the boats on the south end of the building. As you can see on just other site constraints that our team worked with were underlying soils, adjacent wetland and minimizing impacts through additional plantings. And the building was also fixed with um, down lights and an inert metal roof to help min minimize wetland impacts. The project was constructed by GenCap Construction, who also retained interior plumbing and electrical designers so that the final design would interface with the prefabricated metal building designed by Pacific Building Systems. The image to the left shows the construction of the concrete foundation as designed by Civil Tech Engineering, now DEA, with stub outs for utilities. The image to the right shows the metal building framing components as they were assembled on site. The city achieved construction of this important community asset for $1.2 million and interior equipment was furnished by the school district and the engineering team really worked hard to make a concerted effort and options analysis to keep the project costs as low as possible. Here are some photos of the construction, uh, post-construction showing the boathouse balcony on the upper left. And you could see the river in the background and as well as the existing path that runs along the boathouse and then down to the floating dock. The boathouse is really a culmination of many years of planning and staging improvements to the roaded Dungeon Park area, and they enable construction of the first public boathouse serving the North Lake Washington region. And then here are some other photos. There's an interior boathouse rack um, installation, and then also a photo of the existing pathway leading up to the boathouse, uh, looking back from the floating dock. This project would not have been possible without the help of all of our consultants, J3 Architects, DEA through Acquisition of Civil Tech, Dibble Engineers, Northwest Environmental, Karchner Engineering, and Aspect Consulting. The contractor and design team listed here also helped ensure the interior boathouse met the city's needs. That concludes our presentation today. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Nope. All right. Well, with that, then I'll pass things back to Omero. Thank you. Navigating Zoom here. Thank you, Nina. Um, that was right on time. Uh, it was a really nice presentation. And uh, the Kenmore Boat House was awarded the small projects. Outstanding award for the sales section this year. Congratulations. Um, and if there are no more questions, uh, we will move on to the next um, presentation.
which which is a a right Greek fish passage, could be a replacement um, by Osborne Consulting for the city of Sammamish and Stephanie Wines presenting. Uh, so, I, so again, I'll stop sharing my screen so that Stephanie can present. Great, thank you, Homero. Hey, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes, great. Hi, I'm Stephanie Wong with Osborne Consulting. I was a project engineer on the Ebright Creek Fish Passage Project. This was a culvert replacement project carried out by the city of Sammamish and the construction was completed this past fall. Osborne Consulting led the design team, including DCG, who provided structural utilities and roadway restoration design, and the watershed company who provided restoration plantings design. Johansson Construction Company was the contractor and KBA provided construction management. Others involved were Aspect Consulting, DHA, Altaterra, and Equinox. Before I continue, Stephanie Sullivan, the City of Sammamish Project Manager, will give a little background on this project. Thanks, Stephanie. So I just wanna thank ASCE for this award. We we're super excited to share this project with you. Um, this voluntary culvert replacement and fish passage improvement project was prioritized by our city council in 2016 to give Kokanee the best chance at survival. It was approved on our stormwater capital improvement plan, building on the Kokanee work groups, um, blueprint for the restoration and enhancement of Lake Sammamish Kokanee tributaries. As shown on this map, Ebright Creek is one of four primary spawning streams highlighted in dark blue. Uh, we kicked off design in November 2019, just months before COVID changed our world. The project team, our funding partners, permitting agencies, stakeholders, and utility providers all came together virtually to replace an outdated culvert on a busy arterial. This is the second of three culvert replacements the city is committed to on East Lake Sammamish Parkway. To preview some of the details before we dive in, our design eliminated the fish passage barrier, increased flow capacity, improved stream habitat, relocated and maintained underground and overhead utilities, and realigned the creek to reflect more natural conditions. Unknowingly, during the project, we would excavate nearly 100 tons of oil contaminated soil that we found left over from the original roadway improvement done in 1948. And we learned some history too. Uh, a big thank you to the community for their support on this project and funding from the Brian Abbott Fish Barrier Removal Board, King County Flood Control District, and Sammamish Plateau Water and Sewer. Uh, now I'll give it back to Stephanie to share more of the details of the project. Great, thanks. So the previous crossing consisted of two 30 inch diameter concrete culverts, which were replaced by a 14 foot span fish passable culvert. The property owners included King County to the west of the crossing and a private landowner to the east. Although the project length was relatively short, approximately 150 feet, habitat features were densely incorporated into the channel, including large woody material to provide habitat diversity. Good morning. Trees removed during construction were reused for some of the large woody material. And additionally, meander bars and habitat boulders were installed within the culvert to promote hydraulic complexity and preserve the channel form. As Stephanie mentioned, many utilities required relocation, including a water main, communications lines, a power pole, and a sanitary sewer that needed to penetrate the bottom portion of the culvert as shown in the section on the upper right. Now, forward compatibility was a key focus of this project. The city of Sammamish and Sammamish Plateau Water and Sewer District coordinated to install an additional casing under the culvert to accommodate a future sewer line as shown in the section on the bottom right. And the project ensured that the design would also be compatible for future road widening for potential pedestrian improvements. 
So here are some construction photos. The one on the left shows the culvert installation and the sewer penetration through the culvert. The photo on the right shows the culvert backfilled with stream bed sediment and the installation of the culvert lid. Because large amounts of sediment move through this stream, the stream bed material was designed to mimic the existing stream bed to help preserve transport processes. As you can see, there was a full road closure and this allowed the project to be constructed efficiently within a short window. The city did an excellent job communicating project updates to the community through their web, plat web platform, providing weekly updates on the status of the project during construction. A few more photos during construction here. Um, this project was also a highly collaborative effort where communication and coordination with agencies and stakeholders were a key to the success of the project. Uh, for example, the team coordinated with King County who will in the near future replace another culvert under, least, under East Lake Sammamish Trail that's immediately downstream of the project by sharing design information and coordinating restoration plantings to minimize duplication of efforts in the future. The project also had amazing support of the local landowner who owns the property east of the crossing. He is actually an active member of the Kokanee Work Group and was involved on site visits, design review, and construction meetings. And incorporating his input on the upstream flow patterns was very valuable during design. The project also incorporated input from WDFW, the Muckleshoot Tribe, and the Brian Abbott Fish Barrier Removal board technical review team into the design, um, especially uh, on elements regarding large woody material placements. So the photo on the left shows the upstream side of the project during the installation of the large woody material. And engineers were on site during construction to ensure that the wood placement interacted with the stream as intended. The photo on the right shows the downstream side of the project shortly after construction. Lastly, here are a few post-construction photos. Kokanee salmon have been spotted passing through the culvert in November. And with this project, as along with the future replacement of the downstream King County culvert, over a mile of spawning habitat along Ebright Creek will be accessible to the Kokanee salmon, as well as other species, including steelhead, coho salmon, and cutthroat trout. And Chinook salmon also use the delta areas and lower stream reaches for juvenile rearing. And with that, are there any questions? Sure. Uh, see, I noticed it said it was voluntary. Won't it be mandatory eventually? <laughs> Yeah, so this project, um, I don't know if Stephanie, you want to add, but um, this project was identified in a strategic plan to um, improve habitat for the kokanee. And it was, um, before it became mandatory, it was decided to voluntarily replace it. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a question. Do you know when King County will replace the culvert downstream? Stephanie? <laughs> yeah, they're scheduled to replace it, I think, next summer. They're actively constructing um, phase or segment two, phase B. I forget the, uh, the name. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Um, well, this is a very cool project. And it's really impressive to see that fish are using it already. I think it's a big change from two. Um, I mean, this fish patches is much better than the two culverts that were there before. And I am pleased to announce that this project has the Water Resources Outstanding Award for the section in 2022. So congratulations 
to the city of Sammamish and to the Osborne Consulting. Okay, so we are moving along in time. Well, and the next project is the River's Edge to be set back in the geotechnical category um, by Aspect Consulting for the Gemstone Skalalam Tribe. And Mariotto is the presenter. So I'll let Mary take, take over. Hi everyone, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, this is the River's Edge Levy Setback Project and with me presenting is Andy Holmson. Um, and he will start us off today. Thanks, Mari. Um, yeah, my name is Andy Holmson. I'm a geotech geotechnical engineer with Aspect Consulting. And um, we're excited to, to share a little bit about River's Edge Levy Project with you guys tonight. Um, honored to see it recognized uh, as an award winner. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see, substantial completion of the construction of the setback levy was achieved uh, this past September. And then there's a small second season that's kicking off here very soon, uh, which will involve removal of the older. Uh, existing levy. So project is a little bit ongoing, but uh, still, still a great piece to talk about. Um, I'll start by introducing uh, some of the project team um, at the top and, uh, you know, kind of responsible for everything that went on was um, the Jamestown Stalin tribe. They had the vision and forethought to secure land and funding, you know, two critical pieces to any project. Um, and then they pushed it forward on, a, on an aggressive, accelerated schedule and brought together the right pieces to turn that uh, vision into a reality. So uh, they led the way, uh, the prime engineer and lead consultant uh, was Pat McCullough with Engineering Services Association out of Belfair. Um, he pulled the strings and, and led the charge on design. Uh, we played the role of geotechnical engineers. Um, J. Paul Reinheimer was the lead hydraulic engineer with West Consultants. Rob Johnson Land Surveyors provided the survey, and then we had an excellent contractor uh, involved in construction, Delta Industries, uh, led by John Doyle. Um, so it was a good team. We had some uh, excellent partners along with that team. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Clallam County, who I will talk about a little bit more later on and uh, the Dungeness Creamery, which were landowners right adjacent to the project and good partners all along. They even provided some afternoon ice cream during construction, which was really great. So that was the team. Um, I guess I'll give a brief overview on the project background and then hand it over to Mari. So this is a, just a photo of, of the site before construction. Um, it's the opportunity that ended up becoming a reality and um, it's located along the lower part of the Dungeness River, just north of Squim. So it's on the east bank or right bank. And um, it's about a half mile of the river bank. And as you can see there in the photo, it's, it's pastured farmland, or, or it was. And um, the project uh, essentially aims to transform part of that pastured farmland into uh, riparian habitat and floodplain by setting back an old levee, which is along the riverbank and constraining and built in the 60s uh, with a new modern setback levee um, that runs essentially through the middle of that field now. Um, the benefits of that are, are numerous, uh, increased flood storage, uh, flood risk reduction for the, low, for the communities around the lower part of the river, uh, wildly uh, improved habitat for variety of fish species and aquatic uh, organisms. So um, uh, another bit of the background here is uh, this project, River's Edge, actually adjoins and combines with another levee setback project that is being helmed by Clallam County. And together, 
they form a continuous uh, about a mile and a half stretch of improved habitat, opened up floodplain along the lower Dungeness. Um, it's quite impressive. Um, the opportunity to do two of these projects connecting together all at once is, is, is pretty tremendous. The Clown County project is under construction currently, so things are well underway there. Um, this graphic just kind of shows uh, the upper part um, being the Clown County project uh, and the lower part being River's Edge. Left, the left figure shows it without River's Edge, and the right figure shows it with River's Edge added in. So, kind of a cool combining of forces there. And then I think we have one more figure kind of showing a continuous graphic of where this is located and how the two new setback levees will play, all the new habitat area and uh, floodplain that will be opened up by the two projects. So that's background. Uh, I'll hand it over to Mari to talk about some of the schedule and design considerations and the other things that went into the project. Yeah, thank you, Andy. So, this project, it was uh, kind of the catalyst for pushing the flood claim reclamation forward. And the project owner, James Towns Clallam Tribe, they had a very strong desire to complete construction of the new levee in the summer of 2021, so last summer, and remove the existing levee in summer of 2022, and uh, just kind of get that floodplain reclamation going. So. What that meant for us was a very quick project timeline. As you can see here in July, 2020, ESA and our project team was awarded the project. Uh, in just about two months, we completed alternatives analysis and moved through preliminary design. Uh, we received notice to proceed at the end of October, 2020 and at the beginning of November, uh, we moved through permitting and our section 408 or sorry our section 408 submittal and our final design in just about six months so from November 2020 and finishing up in May June of 2021. And then construction was right on the heels of final design so we started that in July and uh, Del Her was able to finish that project in just about two months. And we were on site uh, the entire time watching that get built. So that was a really, really cool experience to see it uh, go straight from design and, and hop right into construction. So right now, as Andy mentioned, uh, there's two seasons of construction. The first was the building of the new setback levy. And the second will start this coming spring and summer of 2022, where the existing levy will be removed and the floodplain will start taking its place. So this required a lot of, uh, you know, this was a very accelerated schedule, required a lot of coordination between the design team and the project owners and other project stakeholders like the Army Corps of Engineers who had to review the design and confirm that it met design and safety criteria and eventually approve us to construct the project. And very quickly, I'll just uh, go through one of the key drivers of this project was actually the discovery that there is a gravel quarry just two minutes down the road from the site. So you can see that in this image over to the right, it's an aerial view taken from Google Maps and that gray spot in the lower right corner is the gravel quarry. Uh, our project team was able to very quickly recognize the benefit of having a material source so close by. You know, it would help with the project timeline, our construction costs, and save on the total life cycle cost and carbon emissions associated with construction. And, you know, typically uh, the first thing you think of when you think of designing a flood protection facility isn't usually to throw a bunch of very pervious material like gravel and sand in there, but we worked with ESA and did a lot of material testing, a lot of design iterations to figure out a way to design the levee with a geometry that would work with this material. So uh, in the end, we were able to come up with a design that worked. 
the Army Corps of Engineers approved it and the construction team completed the levy in just about two months using about 37,000 cubic yards of gravel and sand from the quarry next door and creating this nice, very lovely 2,600 foot long new levy. That brings us to where we are currently. And with that, I'll pass it back to Andy. Yeah, I think you nailed it. So there's a couple post-construction photos of the setback levy. Um, it was great to see it uh, put in. Um, again, it, it, it came together really fast, 14 months from kind of conception to final design and, and construction of the, the levy itself. Um, so it was a fast timeline. It, uh, it's a project that the benefits are gonna continue to evolve and improve over time as that floodplain gets uh, reclaimed and restored. Um, the surface of the levee is a, a beautiful walking trail. It's part of a regional trail network out there um, that has uh, a, a lot of regular use from pedestrians and bird watchers and, and folks of that like. So it's, it's really cool. Um, I think we're all looking forward to seeing the uh, existing levee pulled out here soon and um, the completion of the adjacent project and the net benefits to the community there. So I think that's about the end of our presentation. We had maybe one more slide. Yeah, we did. Okay, yeah. There's some members of the uh, uh, Jamestown Clown Tribe and Clown County giving a tour to uh, Governor Inslee recently. Um, so it was a nice, nice moment there. Anyway, that's uh, our presentation on the River's Edge levy. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mary and Andrew. I think we're uh, running a little bit long in time, but we'll, we'll make that for one question if somebody has a question. Well, I, I have a question. Um, so for the, uh, the removal of the levy this summer, what are the... Um, what are the plans for like restoring that area of the of the floodplain and and you know there'll be vegetation or other channels built or is it just yeah if you can talk about phase two a little more that'd be great yeah yeah uh, good question um, there are some engineered log jams and some habitat features being installed in conjunction with removal of the existing levy um, but it, it other than that it's a pretty passive restoration uh, approach, um, get the old levee out and, and allow the river to kind of do what it, what it wants to do in the floodplain there. Um, there's going to be some construction access roads that are going to um, go out there to remove the existing levee. Those are all going to be underlain by geotextile and geogrid to hopefully kind of roll up the carpet after we're done and get out of there with a light footprint. Um, but other than that, there's, it's going to be a, a bit of a blank slate for the river to plan. So just counting on vegetation filling in naturally? Yeah, no, there is some planting plans as well. Yes, I'm sorry. There's uh, there's some revegetation with some riparian vegetation going on. Too. Yeah, it's a neat project. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you again for, for presenting this project and for the, it's a great project and it was awarded the, the Outstanding award for the geotechnical engineering category. So, congratulations. And now we move on to the next. Category. And this is structures and the next project is the climate pledge arena. By Thornton Tomasetti for Oakview Group and Brian McRae is presenting. Um, go ahead, Brian. All right, let me get my screen pulled up here. Can everyone see that? Yes. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, um, today I'm, I'm here to talk about Climate Pledge Arena. My name is uh, Brian McRae. I'm a vice president with Thornton Tomasetti here in Seattle. Um, we're the structural engineer of record on this project. Um, just a couple of the highlights, um, the goals of this, this facility uh, primarily was to bring uh, hockey and NHL um, back in Seattle. 
Um, other goals is create a uh, modern concert and events venue um, to host modern shows, um, and also to potentially bring an NBA team in eventually, and also create a new home for the Seattle Storm. So first I wanna go into a little bit of history of the facility and an introduction to the project. So the facility was originally constructed in 1962 as part of the Seattle World's Fair. Um, it's located in Seattle Center. Hopefully most of you know where that is. Um, it's uh, primarily an above grade structure at the time. Um, <clears throat> and so that, that structure was completely above grade um, and it provided seating for events and it had uh, cable supported roof system at the time. And then in 1995, um, there was a major renovation done where the bowl was depressed by 38 feet. Um, that was all done within the existing foundations at the perimeter of the structure. So there was no foundations undermined at that time. Um, and then the uh, cable roof support system was uh, switched out for a steel, uh, traditional steel roof trusses. So that gets us to where we are here today in this uh, current development that uh, was completed in 2021. And uh, what made this uh, project so unique was the, um, the requirement to keep the existing roof and existing facade. Um, so in 2017, the Seattle Preservation Landmarks Board um, designated the existing roof and facade as being landmarked. And so um, pretty much everything is new in the structure except for the roof and the facade. So that presented one of the largest challenges in the project is how to maintain the roof and the facade while building an entirely new facility below. And so just highlighting a few of the uh, key elements of the project, um, the bowl uh, structure was uh, lowered about 15 feet below what was done in 1995. Um, the excavation was expanded outwards. So beyond all of the existing foundations undermining nearly the entire um, foundation support of the existing structure. Um, a south atrium you can see here surrounded by glass was added on. A below grade parking garage was added um, to the south of that. Um, a roof seismic retrofit was done uh, of the existing uh, roof structure using ASC 4113. And the facility is set to be the first net zero carbon arena in the world. Um, this ownership commitment there to accomplish that feat over the coming years. So I'm gonna help us address the question, how do we hold up a 44 million pound roof um, while building a facility below? So go into some of the engineering challenges there and, and how we accomplish that. So first one, just going to cover the key structural elements um, of the existing structure. Um, so talking about a few of the key components. Um, so one is the Y columns, you can kind of see off to the left here. Um, those are 20 of the Y columns that go around the perimeter of the, what we call the box girder, um, which support the steel roof trusses above. And so those primarily support gravity loads and take some lateral loads. Um, the chevron legs shown on the right, they're a pair of, uh, or sorry, four pairs of two chevron legs each. So a total of eight. Um, those primarily resisted lateral loads, so wind and seismic loads, basically structure. And then the buttress, which you can see on the right-hand side. And there are four buttresses, um, one on each side of the structure. So looking at the structure, how we supported the existing structure. So we have the, um, this is kind of a model of, of what that looked like when it was temporarily supported. Um, just a brief overview how this is accomplished. We drove uh, piles down from the ground surface. And then as we excavated around, uh, basically steel trusses and braces were installed um, to temporarily resist all of the seismic and wind forces as we excavated down. Um, so a couple of the key features I'll get into here, but they had the chevron bracing shown off to the left um, and the trusses and braces that were installed for that as we excavated down. Um, kind of in the middle, you can see highlighted there the uh, support for the Y column and the two steel pipes that were used to support each uh, Y column condition. And then the south buttress shown on the right and the south buttress had to be partially removed. The entire foundation was, um, was cut off and that was to support the new atrium and parking garage that was installed on the south side. So here's a view of the uh, roof structure being supported temporarily. Um, as you can see the excavation occurring around all of those steel pipe columns. And this is looking kind of straight from the south directly at the south buttress. Um, you can see the existing rebar there sticking out from that. Um, and you're kind of looking straight there from the south. Uh, so just highlighting a couple of the elements here of uh, the support system. So we had the Y column shown on the left and the temporary support for that. 
And then on the right is showing the concrete columns that were brought up to meet that existing Y column right about where the existing foundation would have been. Um, so those columns for scale are about three and a half feet by seven feet, something like that, um, that are brought up from uh, about 55, 60 feet below um, up to meet that Y column. Um, so next I'll show the south buttress here. We use what we call the, a kickstand um, shown on the left side, which is uh, basically a vertical support and then kind of a collar wrapped around that um, to take out thrust force. And that was braced back to a shoring wall system about 160 feet away. So you could see those long braces bracing it back to a new shoring wall. Um, and then the right-hand side, you can see we supported this with a permanent condition with an eight foot thick uh, concrete shear wall. And that's what was a permanent bracing for that buttress. So I'm just gonna get in to highlight quickly some of the new elements of the structure. The new bolt system was a steel um, composite floor framing system. We use precast stadia units on rakers. And then uh, buckling and restraining. Oh. All right, thank you. Um, we had buckling and restrained brace frames and concrete shear walls uh, made up the lateral system of the building. A couple other highlights in the interior. Um, there's a press level uh, bridge truss that extends over the entire west side of the facility. The 275 foot span supported by two trusses, a Verendil truss in the front and a Warren truss in the back. And then uh, to resist uh, or to, to control the vibrations of such a long span, um, TT designed uh, tune mast dampers. You can kind of see there on the bottom right. Uh, so next, I highlight the rigging grid. Uh, the rigging grid is primarily there to support both the, the two major scoreboards for the facility and also any future concerts and shows. Um, it has over 200,000 pounds of support capacity and is braced off to the existing roof using buckling and restraining braces and also hung from the roof, as you can kind of see here in the close-up. Um, there's a fair number of roof retrofits that had to take place to support that uh, heavy load of the new uh, rigging grid system. So brief summary of overall project. Um, obviously, a project like this would not have been possible without such an incredible team. Um, the ownership group, Oakview Group, um, was uh, represented by owner rep of CA Icon. Architect is Populous out of Kansas City. And construction manager is Mortensen. And there's just a few key facts of the project down there. Um, but you know, home to the new Kraken team and over 17,000 fans at each uh, home event. That's the end of my presentation. Open up for any questions. Thank you, Ryan. It's a very impressive project. I don't see any questions in the chat. I see a question from Elizabeth Lenker. She said, ask, what lessons did you learn during construction? What lessons did we learn? Um, well, I, I'd say, um, you know, something like this is just not possible without everybody being on board with the process. So there was, you know, considerable number of meetings that took place on site as challenges come about. Um, but with everything not working as a team and, and, the, and the team not working together collaboratively to find solutions, I, I just don't think this project would have been possible. So I'd say that's one of the things I, I, I certainly got to experience firsthand throughout. Thank you, Ryan. And then we have mm -hmm. one second question, and I think this is the last, so we can move to the next one. So the next project is, what's, what was the total cost of the, of the arena? Uh, it's approximately a billion dollars. Um, I think I, I, I've heard numbers around 900 something million to just over a billion. All right, yeah. Well, we have, we have one last question. Mm -hmm. um, how was the quality of the Asbill drawings from 1962? Did you find any <laughs> surprise changes? Um, I'd say, that's a good question. Uh, the quality drawings is actually quite well, uh, quite good. Um, uh, the information was, was very clear. Uh, I would say the, the most interesting part of the existing drawings is it only took uh, 18 sheets um, to show the entire existing structure where the new structure was you know, in the hundreds. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, we actually used a, a laser uh, point cloud um, process to validate all the existing uh, geometries. And so we used that. And then the, the existing structure was also modeled in software called Rhino um, to really be able to kind of dial in on the existing elements and, and model those accurately. So there was a lot of work that went in to validate the existing structure um, in the field as well. well 
Well, this was pretty impressive. Ryan, thank you. All right, thank um, you very much. And, and this project won the Outstanding Award for Structures this year for the Seattle section. And I believe that they are going to present next at our next inner meeting together with the structural uh, group. So stay tuned for that. And we we moved next to, to our next project. And that's the 2021 Airfield Pavement Replacement and Infrastructure Upgrade Project for the Transportation and Development category. This is NTV for the Port of Seattle and Robert Miller will be presenting. So I'll let you present. Okay, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, oops. Um, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, thank you all for the opportunity to describe um, what the Port of Seattle is doing on the airfield uh, of SeaTac Airport. It's maybe not as eye-catching as uh, something like Climate Pledge Arena, but um, the airfield at the at SeaTac is an important part of our, our region's infrastructure. Um, this project is um, uh, part of the airport's uh, pavement management program, and I'll get into it in a moment, but the owner is the Port of Seattle. Uh, the project sponsor is the Port of Seattle Airport Operations Group. Uh, the project management was handled by the in-house team uh, in the airport's program management group or project management group. The design team was a collaborative effort between Port of Seattle Engineering Group and HNTB. Construction management was handled in-house by the port's uh, construction management team and the contractor was Scarcella Brothers. Um, the project itself was actually three projects wrapped up into uh, one larger project and it involved um, uh, the work areas that we call work area S highlighted in green on the lower left of your screen, which is pavement reconstruction around the South Satellite. Um, and then work area C, which is cargo four, is the uh, square of pavement rehabilitation shown in the reddish or the orangish figure in the lower right. And then uh, the large expanse of blue uh, is the what we call the work area RT, stands for runway and taxiway system. It's the airport's west runway and parallel taxiway. And that portion of the work involved joint seal and replacement. And I mentioned this, this overall project was part of the airport's overall pavement management program, really intended to extend the life of uh, their pavement infrastructure um, out of the airfield, extend and maximize the design line or the uh, useful life. And while they're at it, when they're uh, removing concrete and pavements, they go ahead and uh, upgrade uh, aging and outdated utilities uh, in the vicinity. So going through each of the work areas, you can see work area S, the photo in the uh, lower right shows the sort of hodgepodge of, of pavement um, uh, repairs that have done over the years. Uh, the pavement itself is some of the heaviest used pavements at SeaTac and serves their wide body international air carriers. Um, the hangar buildings to the left are Alaska Airlines maintenance facility. So that was a key consideration. And down in the lower part is Concourse A and then Delta Airlines uh, maintenance hangar. So um, reconstruction of those pavements had significant um, operational impacts. Um, the project itself involved uh, replacement of the pavements. Um, all that area shaded in blue and green here on this page. Um, joint seal uh, around the perimeter of these pavements and then uh, removal and replacement of slotted drains and upgrading of the uh, industrial waste system out there. And then drain lines for some uh, uh, electrical structures. The way that we approached this was uh, a very collaborative effort with the port and um, their gate scheduling team and Alaska Airlines and their, their uh, maintenance operations team. Um, and we ended up uh, subdividing the work into four main work areas, um, S1, S2, S3, and S4. S1 and S2 at the north half and S3 and S4 at the, excuse me, at the um, west half and then S3 and S4 at the eastern part. 
And this is an, an, as an example of some of the things that were looked at when developing that phasing plan, because phasing was the, uh, one of the primary concerns was operations and getting airplanes into and out of uh, the uh, adjacent gates or the gates adjacent to the work areas and also maintaining access to Alaska Airlines. So to get around that, we developed uh, operational modeling plans uh, that were uh, reviewed by air traffic and ground, ground control towers, uh, as well as the um, Alaska Airlines and, and Delta uh, and other stakeholders. You can see in that photo the really tight working conditions. So every square inch of space mattered in this case and, and uh, maximizing the amount of space that the contractor, contractor could work, but also providing um, safe environment for airport operations. And the other thing that was looked at carefully was the impact of jet blasts so that we maintained um, uh, a safe environment for workers and, and uh, aircraft taxiing on adjacent taxiways. And we did that by using the jet blast model and you see on the lower, lower left. Um, another challenge uh, was maintaining utility services throughout the project. Um, and in this case, uh, some outdated and aging water mains that needed replacement. So we developed a temporary water service to maintain um, water connection to the facilities, uh, Alaska Airlines facilities during construction. And then uh, more challenging was the utility or the uh, uh, power connection. There's electrical vaults uh, in the work area S vicinity that are the primary electrical fleets to the South Satellite and could not be taken offline. And so um, we also were unsure of the structural capacity of these vaults. And so uh, what we did to get around uh, those vaults was we developed um, sort of a, a bridging section. Um, and so this uh, 19 inches of double matted reinforced concrete spans over the um, utility structure like a bridge so that we don't have to rely on, on the, uh, the structure itself providing structural support for the aircraft that are taxiing above it. Um, and in that way, they were able to do much of the work with uh, uh, out disrupting the, the power service that's running through the vaults. And you can see from the uh, close proximity of the vaults from the sketch on the lower left that uh, we developed some custom panel designs to bridge over those, those structures. Then on completion, actually this photo on the right is not quite completed. This was in September of this year, showing the completion of work area S1 and S2. And, S4 is under construction still, but uh, it has since been completed uh, and uh, open successfully. Then work area C has similar conditions. Work area C is the cargo four apron. Uh, it serves um, cargo operations for Alaska Airlines, as well as Prime Air that um, serves uh, Amazon and their, their distribution facility. It also was reaching the, the pavement there was reaching the end of its its useful life and was starting to deteriorate. You could see some of the, in the photos, some of the cracked panels. And there was um, like uh, also a work area S, some uh, old uh, slotted drains that were failing uh, and causing um, maintenance challenges. Um, and again, one of the challenges here with this project was construction phasing and working around uh, existing airport operations. Uh, and so in this particular case, the work area was subdivided into three work areas. Um, and again, the work areas were subdivided there uh, to minimize impacts. So you can see work area C1, uh, they built that, that uh, new, new pavement while Alaska and Amazon were still able to operate out of part of the, um, part of the apron. And then C2, the flip-flopped. And then C3 was actually a full closure to rehabilitate the adjacent roadway where the entire apron was not accessible to aircraft. And that was a quick uh, 32 hour period of time where the contractor worked around the, around the clock to get that done. Um, you can see the completed product here with the new pavement for the uh, cargo apron, uh, new uh, asphalt roadway, and then uh, some new, nice new, uh, uh, trench drains for the drainage systems. Uh, work area RT was, I mentioned, a joint seal uh, on the runway and parallel taxiway. The joint seal has reached the end of its useful life. Believe it or not, the third, for those that have been around a while, the third runway is 25 years old now. Um, and uh, 
uh, again, phasing was a main concern and keeping the uh, runway and taxiway system operational yep. as much as possible. Um, and uh, the work on the runway and taxiway complex was primarily done at night when uh, operations are reduced, but we did provide some uh, opportunities for the contractor to finish out some uh, portions of the work during the day. Um, and the way that that was um, evaluated is we looked at uh, different flow conditions. So when the runway is operating in a, a north flow and a south flow condition, we had identified areas where the contractor could work without disrupting um, uh, aircraft arrivals and departures. And uh, at the same time, looked at how the contractor would access that work to get the uh, work area to get the um, needed work done. Um, at the completion of the project, you can see here the nice new joints for the, uh, the runway. Uh, uh, something noteworthy here is there were two different joint, joint materials called out, a compression joint seals on the runway, and then a, um, a port in place silicone sealant on the taxiway system. That's why they, they look different in this after photo. Um, the way the schedule worked out, because of all the work that needed to get done and the compressed time frame, it was only um, nine months to get all this work done. Um, the contractor, uh, or the poor actually, um, uh, developed plans to get the contractor out there as quickly as possible in the spring, uh, knowing that this work is highly weather dependent. Uh, so on April 1st, or uh, first week of April, the contractor was... Um, out there working in work area S1, followed quickly by work area S2. And then in the schedule, we built in uh, that green bar, um, a uh, no work period around the South Satellite, which is the peak um, uh, uh, travel period, uh, summertime travel period. So there would be no work during that, that period around the South Satellite. Um, that dovetailed nicely with uh, the peak cargo season in the spring, which involved, uh, among other things, uh, cherry deliveries, um, so that the contractor was able to uh, do all the work with really one paving crew and shift from work area S to get the cargo work done in the middle of the summer. And then in uh, mid-August, return back to work area S to get the uh, concrete paving done. Um, another challenge was uh, planning for contingencies, and uh, it was a bit of a curveball thrown at us um, in the um, that August period during that no work period. No work uh, period. Uh, it became the port became aware that there's a potential threat of a labor action that could disrupt the flow of concrete coming out to the airport. So the port actually took a pause uh, in construction about two weeks to really um, consider the risks involved with opening the pavement uh, and what would happen should uh, a labor action cause a delay in the receipt of concrete, because they certainly couldn't um, have that uh, south satellite pavement not available for aircraft operations. So after considering the risks and coming up with some contingency planning, which involved development of a uh, an asphalt pavement section in the event that it's needed. After two weeks of considering the risks, uh, we decided to all go, or the port decided to all go. And um, uh, even with that two week delay, the contractor was able to complete uh, all the work just in time for the peak travel season uh, of Thanksgiving, which was our target date to begin with. Um, and so that's just a quick highlight. Uh, appreciate the time. And uh, if you have any questions. Thank you, Rob. We are running a little bit behind schedule now. Uh, we have two questions. So if you can give us a quick answer. One is how thick are the airport pavements? And the other one is, was this the first maintenance on the third runaway, runway since it was built? Um, so the first question is easy, it's 19 inches thick. Um, and the uh, second question was, is this the first maintenance? Uh, it's a, as far as I know, it's the first major maintenance on that runway. Thank you, Rob. And this project got uh, an honor award for the transportation and development category. So thank you and congratulations. 
Thank you. And we move on to our second to last presentation. In the interest of time. And this is the Seattle Tacoma International Airport North Satellite Modernization. So it's also in the CTAC. So there's a lot of work going on in CTAC. This is uh, by ACOM. And Daniel Tauber is going to be presenting. So go ahead. Okay, let's see if I can get my presentation up. Um, can everyone see that? Yes. All right, terrific. Um, so yeah, this is going to sound familiar. Another project from um, some SeaTac Airport. So we're happy um, and pleased that you're giving us a little bit of time to talk about the North Satellite Modernization um, at SeaTac. So I'm Daniel Tauber, uh, AECOM Project Manager for this project. And um, I'll be joined presenting by Eric McClure, AECOM Civil Engineer, and Ken Warren, who is the um, Capital Program Manager for the Port of Seattle at SeaTac Airport for this project. Let's see. I can advance that. There we go. So, um, AECOM, we're honored to be the prime design consultant for this project, but you can see that we had um, a really big team of collaborators uh, for the project, and, and it was a great team. It has been a great team for the whole project. Really, everyone was pulling together um, in the same direction to deliver, you know, a successful project for um, for the airport. And um, and on the construction side, we had um, Hensel Phelps as GCCM leading um, a construction team uh, with their trade partners to to turn the design that um, that all of us developed um, into reality. Um, so. The, the original North Satellite um, was built in the 70s, and this project to modernize it was um, eight years in the making. And um, the goals of the project were to expand the facility by about 50%, so going from 12 aircraft contact gates up to 20, and to um, renew and replace all of the building systems um, throughout the facility. So, if you have a recollection of the old North Satellite, the end gates at SeaTac, what you may recall was um, the 1970s facility was kind of closed in and, um, and dimly lit in there. And so if you have the chance to, to travel Alaska Airlines, who's the carrier operating out there and go out to the new end gates, I think you'll be very surprised at what it looks like now. Um, it's a facility that's got um, lots of open space. It's got tremendous amounts of daylight in it. It's got an amazing art program and great concessions. So it's really a facility that is, um, you know, worthy of being um, uh, the place for Alaska's flagship operations at SeaTac. And I wanted to talk um, briefly just about one of the big challenges on the project. Um, and on any airport project, you heard some similar things from Rob talking about the pavements, but in our case, um, how do we keep the existing facility operating continuously while renovating it? And um, one of the key ways that we accomplished that challenge um, was by the structural solution for an element of the building that we call the wedge. So the wedge, if you look at the photo in the lower right, is kind of the central portion of the building. Uh, and that wedge um, goes over the existing structure. And so the structure for the wedge was a key part of the solution to keep the existing facility operating. So you can see on the upper right, um, trusses. So the wedge is spanned by trusses um, over 200 feet long that were above the existing structure and that land on buckling restrained braces at the four corners of the wedge that are placed outboard of the existing structure. So this approach allowed us to install the wedge structure um, without interfering with the existing building. So the existing building was operating, passengers were traveling, flights were departing, 
while these 200 foot trusses were erected over and around that existing facility. And then um, as construction proceeded, you know, we put a roof on that, we dried it in, and we were able to come back later and demolish the existing structure underneath that wedge. And by doing so, we opened up this dramatic interior space um, in the facility with ceilings that are up to 85 feet high at one point, um, and, a, and the whole area kind of drenched in light. And, and that area under the wedge is what we call the marketplace at N. Um, so that's just a little bit about the architecture of the facility. Now what I'd like to do is hand it over to our civil engineer, Eric McClure, to talk about what went on outside of the building. Thanks, Tina. So lots of, of great civil engineering here, and, and I'm, I'm not taking credit for it because John Martin, who was, was with our firm and has, has since passed on, was uh, really the, the, the mind behind a, a lot of this uh, that happened on the airfield um, and, and adjacent to the, to, to the structure. Um, and, and the upper left-hand um, picture here, you can see the aircraft movement uh, and aerial view of the, um, of the uh, new north set. Now, in, um, we did something pretty innovative here with, with traffic movement. Um, and uh, John really took the initiative here um, because we needed to move traffic in, in two directions or you can see two aircraft moving, approaching the ta exterior taxi lane there uh, adjacent to each other. He created what was called a triple taxi lane. Um, a, lot of, a lot of work went into this uh, with the FAA and, um, and, and with the, the airport itself to, to, to justify the need for, for uh, aircraft that are going to be operating that close together. That triple taxi lane um, can handle uh, two group three aircraft or, or one group four aircraft um, in, in either direction at the same time. So that really uh, moves a lot of aircraft traffic um, back and forth from North Sat and, and taxi and, uh, and Concourse Delta. Um, that was, it was very innovative and uh, took a lot of time to figure that out, uh, but um, uh, made a big difference in, in uh, the passenger experience there. Just uh, no delays and, and uh, getting an aircraft to, to, to these new gates, uh, as Dan mentioned, um, went from 12 gates to, to 20 gates there. So um, you can see the ground operations in the lower left, left hand picture, uh, adjacent aircraft there for Alaska. A lot of Alaska movement uh, coming back and forth on that new apron. Um, the other thing that um, we did, obviously, around the building was a lot of panel replacement, uh, 625,000 um, square square feet of, uh, of new apron uh, in and around the uh, the building. And up adjacent to the building uh, was a um, because of the existing 1970 structure, um, as Dan mentioned, uh, really had some some um, structural. Uh, issues and was not designed for the new seismic code. Um, we had to come up with some innovative features to um, to retrofit an existing building. So it's it's uh, obviously a lot more difficult than um, situations where you're building a new building. It's it's trying to fix something that's already there in in, in the ground and, and obviously keep the building operational at the same time. So um, the structural retrofit shown in the upper right hand corner are um, is the uh, uh, the, help me out here, Dan. The uh, uh, moment uh, frames that were uh, put together. Sorry, yep. Dan's on mute. That's all right. <laughs> so, thanks. The moment frames that were designed integral to the building uh, that uh, stabilized the, the new structure, and um, and those were mounted to a um, a facility uh, or to to new uh, reinforcement panels that wrap the building in kind of what we we called it uh, gave it a seismic hug. Um, so the, you know, it, it kind of took the old structure, wrapped it in uh, a new structure that uh, would meet those codes and, and made it uh, safe for, for uh, those that are they're using the building today. Um, so I mentioned just a lot of uh, innovative features went into the, to the civil side, not just uh, pavement. Those are um, 17 inch thick slab around the building, but uh, the interesting civil feature, are, you know, structural features are, are what you, um, you kind of don't see in the building today. And um, uh, it, it really makes it uh, uh, really special. But um, pass it on to Kim to talk a little bit about, had a lot of sustainability on this project, a lot of um, innovative features that Ken can talk to here too. Absolutely. And uh, Eric, it was really cool to uh, see that seismic hug and we saved about $50 million on the overall program by uh, imploring that uh, innovative feature of freezing the internal 1970 structure 
within this new facility. So some really great things that uh, we did from a structural and civil perspective. And I'd like to touch on some things that we did that uh, really helped with sustainability and uh, uh, the Port of Seattle has been committed and SeaTac Airport in particular to be the greenest and most efficient port and airport in North America. So we have some huge goals and some uh, great objectives that we're trying to achieve. And the North Satellite Modernization Program really contributed to that. Uh, one of the things we employed was a uh, rainwater storage tanks, which really was collecting rainwater up on the roof of the airport and then flushing uh, toilets and uh, urinals within the facility. And you might imagine the amount of water that, uh, that we might save through this uh, uh, initiative amounts to about 2.5 million gallons of domestic water per year. So it really is a lot of water that we're saving. It's not uh, transformational in any sense of the imagination as far as, you know, people have been using rainwater to flush toilets and to use it to water plants and things like that for years and years and years. But this is something new and different for the airport. Uh, you know, we have a, a lot of security and FAA requirements and uh, this was a first for the airport. So a great thing and uh, we're super excited about uh, saving some water and uh, really helping uh, uh, meet some of our sustainability challenges of the future. Another thing that we really like to do at SeaTac Airport is try to bring in new controls and technology and a lot of our mechanical and infrastructure systems within the building. We, we really wanted to turn things off when they needed to be off and turn them on when they need to be on. And as part of that, it really included remodeling and renovating the entire baggage control system, the entire baggage infrastructure system, which included ECM motors, variable frequency drives, and new control technology. So that way we can actually turn the baggage system off. So the baggage system is now smart and it says, if there's not a bag coming and if there's no bags on the belts, then why are we operating? Let's save some energy guys. So the baggage system has now been completely renovated to a new smart control system. And we have a, a new escalator motor system for all of the escalators in the North Satellite and the end of Concourse C, which you can see here, which is a beautiful new escalator lit by LED lights. And it has sensors that sense whether someone is approaching the escalators within about six feet. And then the uh, motor actually turns the torque on and we save about 33% of all of our electricity consumed by an escalator during that period of time. So when no one's riding on the escalators, we're saving 30%, even though it still looks uh, effectively like the escalator is operating, what it's doing is it's in a freewheeling type mode, saves that 30% of the energy. And part of the reason why we did that was L&I and TSA and FAA and a lot of our federal partners Everyone was a little nervous about if we actually turn the escalator off to save all the savings, uh, that the public generally doesn't adjust well to an escalator that's off, they would uh, turn and uh, move elsewhere. So we keep the escalators on and we, we uh, challenge ourselves to capture the energy that we can. And then another great thing that we did, um, as Dan pointed out with the architecture of the building is really bring in daylight the 1970 facility of the North Satellite was designed and terminal design has changed over the years in the last 50 years. And so this building is really a giant square to get light penetration into the center of the facility. And AECOM really came up with a, a unique solution to uh, create this river situation, which introduced clear story so that daylighting can penetrate deep into the hold rooms and up and down the uh, areas where the consumers can, can dine and uh, uh, make retail purchases and things like that. So it's really a smart, well-designed and well thought of facility that fits the Northwest look and feel. Um, I'd like to close with the uh, great news that we're tracking to about $30 million under the budget. We opened this project on June 23rd, 2021 approximately three months early, which is transformational and great groundbreaking work by our entire team to be able to achieve those type of results in the environment that we had and had to endure with COVID as well as the escalating environment uh, 
for construction in the Seattle market. With that, I, that's the completion of our presentation. We'd really like to thank you so much for listening and uh, any questions. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is also a, a really great project. I don't see questions in the chat. And in the interest of time, we are running already 15 minutes late. So I will let the last team um, do the presentation. So this is this is the oh and uh, the Celta Common International Airport Satellite Modernization North Satellite Modernization Project uh, received the also an honor award, an honor Tokyo award. Uh, congratulations. I'm sorry that I'm moving fast, but we have seven teams that are presenting. And so I move on to the next team that is the Norgate link extension um, by MGA, 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 and it's for Sun Transit. And Lacey will be presenting. So I'll stop sharing and I'll let you present. And we have 10 minutes total. All right, thank you. Um, hello. My name is Lacey Maylert, and I work for McMillan Jacobs Associates, who were the prime consultant for the Northlink Extension Project. In broad strokes, the Northlink is a significant extension of Sound Transit's existing light rail system connecting SeaTac Airport in South Seattle to the downtown core. Lacey, are you presenting? Am I not screening? Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, so I, can you see my screen now? I can see it now, yeah. Great, sorry everybody. Um, so to jump back into it, um, so the light rail extension is now, has been extended into North Seattle and the twin board tunnels and three station that comprise the extension showcase advanced design methods, project coordination and design work that meet the needs of the city of Seattle, transit agencies, higher educational institutions and the communities Northgate Link serves. So as this is a short presentation, I'll be briefly touching on these aspects by sharing with you fun facts that you cannot see from the surface. So before I dig in, I would like to take a moment to thank the 30 plus firms we teamed with to accomplish this multi-stage decade long undertaking with over, we had over, 1,200 design personnel working on it, accumulating upwards of a million design hours. So thank you for, huge thank you to everyone. So to get onto it, the first aspect of the project I'll talk about is the tunnels. So 3.5 miles of the alignment comprised of twin board tunnels excavated using a tunnel born machine, which you can see in the photo here. Along the alignment, we had 23 cross passages. And the fun fact about the tunnels is the original design had the board tunnels stopping approximately 6,000 feet south of the current portal location, as you can see in the graphic on the screen. So during the early work studies and value engineering workshops, the team analyzed and optimized the preliminary track alignment for construction constraints impact to third party organizations and cost. So the original alignment called for an additional half a mile of cut and cover trackway along a residential street before transitioning to the elevated guideway. However, our team then proposed the extension of the board tunnel segment to the current portal and elevated guideway location. And this eliminated construction related impacts to this neighborhood and mitigated operational noise as the alignment could be bored deeper than a cut and cover segment. So traveling north along the alignment, our first station is located in the densely populated area of the University District. At 80 feet deep and 400 feet long, it is the shortest in length as was necessary given the available footprint of the city. So the temporary support of excavation of the station included tiebacks, which are long tendons that anchor into the soil. In our case, the tiebacks extend under existing buildings, streets, and utilities, as you can see in the graphic on the screen. 
So for urban environments, local jurisdictions usually require tiebacks to be detentioned, which involves constructing blockouts in the permanent concrete basement walls before project completion. Installation and backfill of these blockouts are labor intensive and tend to interrupt the continuity of the basement's waterproofing system and influence the location of floor slabs. So with over 1,200 tiebacks and the complexity detentioning entailed, McMillan Jacobs saw an opportunity to improve upon the standard practice. During the design, the team developed the detail you see on the screen. The twin wide flange soldier piles stitch welded together at their flanges create a cavity between the two webs, which allow a core drill to cut each of the tieback strands from the surface. This innovation results in several key benefits, including schedule savings, as all tiebacks can be quickly detentions, cost savings, as blockouts and the station lining were eliminated, including the complex waterproofing details, and safety was improved as remote detentioning of tiebacks from the surface is significantly safer than torch cutting, which puts your, a welder space really close to that stress anchor. So the second station along the alignment is located adjacent to Roosevelt High School in the Roosevelt neighborhood. And at 90 feet deep, it is the deepest station along the new alignment. Facilitated by a GCCM contract, the design team worked closely with the contractor and owner to develop cost savings and schedule savings alternatives throughout the project. And in the case of Roosevelt, the contractor approached the design team with a alternative to the support of excavation. The original design called for secant piles, about 440 total piles, which equates to about 12 miles of drilled pile in the ground. And then the contractor preferred a slurry wall panel design because they already had the equipment and, and proposed a schedule benefit to using this method and better verticality control when installing the panels. So during construction, the design team worked to change the sequence or the um, support of excavation. So now Northgate Station is the last stop along the new alignment and the only elevated one. Not shown is the accompanying parking garage also completed under this contract. So Northgate Station is a regional hub directly accessible to bus transit, regional entertainment, and major community college. Northgate Link is estimated to serve 49,000 daily riders this year. The project significantly increases mobility between major population cores and work centers in the Seattle area, enhancing living standards for our community. So with this extension, there are now 19 connected stations north and south of Seattle's downtown core connecting communities, businesses, and visitors to more neighborhoods and all they have to offer. So I have quickly touched on a lot of interesting aspects spanning 12 years through planning, design, construction, and implementation that just wouldn't have been possible without the brains and hard work and support from all my coworkers and partners on this project. So thanks again and um, available if anyone has any questions. Uh, thank you, Lacey. This is a really brief presentation. Uh, it's a big project and I don't see questions on the chat. Oh, I see a question by Daniel Tauber. That is, where were the TBMs abandoned in place? They were not. They, um, they were brought out of the stations used as, um, yeah, they were brought out of the station. So the tunneling contract also contained the excavation of the stations, and those were used as the launch sites and um, retrieval sites for the TBMs. They're being reused, is that what you said? Oh, reused. Um, I don't recall what specifically happened to the two tunnel okay. boring machines that we okay. had. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question is, what changes in design methods did you see over the course of design? 
Yeah. Um, one major change, I think, would be the modeling of the project and the tools we were allowed and given. So you saw earlier in my presentation the use of Google SketchUp to showcase the shoring and staging of the contract. But uh, throughout the past 12 years, we have moved through um, CAD and now onto Revit. So utilizing Revit has been a huge success in making those late, late changes during construction. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, and for the, this project is, is awarded the Outstanding Award for the, the Transportation and Development category. So congratulations. It was, all of these projects are, are really good. We are really happy with with all the projects that were uh, submitted. And we went from small, very small projects, you know, the Kenmore House to very big projects like the, all these, um, all these last four projects and, and the North Gate Link extension is the biggest of them all. It's very, Pleasant to see um, all this civil engineering happening in Seattle and, and being able to share it with all the membership. Um, and so congratulations to all the teams. And with that, I conclude our award ceremony. Thank you very much for attending. And uh, I wanted to thank Ashraf, our host and hospitality chair that has, is always in the background in our meetings and just wanted to, to thank him. And do we have any other uh, closing remarks, Don? I just wanted to note that we do have regional and national level awards for AC as well, and so we will send that information along to all of the uh, projects here today. Uh, and they are separate um, competitions, so if you want to submit to one or the other or both, that's up to you. Yeah, the submission dates for the regional competition is April 1st, and for the national competition is June 1st. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Well, and um, 